Hi guys, welcome to The Social Block, the podcast where we explore the intersection between blockchain technology and society. As usual, today we'll be exploring how this new technology can shape our lives, us as individuals, our institutions, our culture, and hopefully create a more empowered and equitable society. Our episode for today is blockchain and OSS community progress and compensation. And our guest is called Max Howell, CEO of TXYZ. I'm your host, Maggie, you already know me. And before we start our episode, I just wanna ask anyone watching this to subscribe up here and like the episode. This is really gonna help us get the needed listens and the exposure that we need to keep the podcast running for you. Also remember, you can email us in at socialblock at nexo.com for any topic suggestions, any feedback, if you wanna be a guest. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. I'm Christova Maggie. You can find it in the description and as well find the social block on TikTok where I post shorts with highlights of each episode. So if you just want to watch like little 30 second highlights and sound bites, that's the place for you. Our handle is social.block. So that's everything and let's get into the episode. Hi, Max. It's lovely to have you here today. And um, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and about TXYZ. Uh, what do you guys do? What are you all about? Hey, well, thank you for having me here. And yeah, I'd happily uh, tell you a little bit about myself and uh, the company that I formed somewhat recently. Um, so, you know, I'm most famous for this piece of software I wrote, this open source software called Homebrew, which you know, it's it's very difficult to know how well used it is, but there was definitely a period um, about like eight, seven or eight years ago, where it just became impossible not to meet someone in tech who didn't use it or had heard of it or used it at some point, and maybe they didn't use Mac, so they didn't use it day to day, but they knew of it. And, uh, you know, and then over the years after that, it just became the point where there, there was a point where if, I found a new developer tool or open source project and it didn't have room install instructions somewhere in there. I'd be like, what's wrong with this project? And like, There's no like ego in it. it. It was just like, I became a user like everybody else and expected it, it became so prevalent. So we, we think there's probably like uh, 40 or 50 million users of it, honestly. Like it's a significant percentage of how many developers there are in the world. And, uh, you know, like for people who don't know, it's, um, I always say it's just a package manager because like, to me, it always seemed like just like this essential tool that isn't that important. It, it's just essential. <laughs> it's not that exciting. But I like to say that package managers aren't sexy, but the things you do with them are, and that, that, <laughs> that's, that's the truth of it. Like you, it's very difficult to use open source without this tool. Um, so, you know, that was 2009, quite some time ago. And, uh, it, you know, like I got into programming, uh, like an unusual way. Uh, I think it's an important part of my story. I, uh, didn't know what I was going to do with my life, honestly, um, as a, a late teenager. And I had a few options and programming was one because I'd learned how to program at a young age and I'd been doing it as a hobby. But uh, at the time, like, it wasn't a very um, well-respected career choice. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember meeting, yeah, yeah, like this was uh, 1998 or something, you know. And uh, oh, I Oh, yeah, so you're like slightly before that period where like programming just became like the career choice. Exactly, yeah. Like, um, <laughs> like when I was first, when I first got into the industry, I, I'd go like out and meet people and I would avoid saying what I did <laughs> for a living. I'd try and like work it out of the conversation because there was this stigma associated with it. So like you've probably seen. Yeah, I, I feel that way now with like working in the blockchain space. Um, occasionally, like I'll be in a, a situation where I'm super OK saying that I work in crypto. And then there's other times where I just feel yeah, like the hostility. <laughs> so I'm just kind of like, I want to tell you what I do, but I know that if I do I may just end up having to explain myself and I don't want to do that because I love my job. I love this industry, but yeah, <laughs> I, I can it, get exactly. it. You're just kind of like, yeah. I'll tiptoe because I, I just don't want to deal with people sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pivot. Like it's, it's, um, 
an interesting point that I hadn't really considered that working and like I've I've, I've identified this connection between Web3 and how it felt for me when I first got into uh, career programming in like 2007. Like uh, if the, the communities feel very similar. And that's one aspect mm, yeah. of it, which is also similar. And I hadn't really thought of that. It's like uh, people don't yet see how this is cool <laughs> in, a, in a sort of broader scale. Yeah, I think I've talked about this in one of the other episodes as well, is that I can't always tell because I, I got into like the blockchain space. So it, like it, it was just very random. I, I got lucky, essentially. And I find I'm a curious person, so I find it cool. But I wonder, like, do I live in a bubble where most people don't actually know what all this is about? Because to me, it feels like everybody knows and like, you, you know, it's it's all over the place. But um, I don't know. I, I feel like I wonder whether it's a bubble. Because like you're you're like giving me the opposite. It's like, oh yeah, people don't know it's cool yet. Yeah, well, um, you know, if it goes how Web two went, which is what I think it will do, um, you know, for a while everyone's like, you know, you you've seen these articles in the newspapers where they were like, the internet's a fad, and that you know that was the Web yeah, one yeah. time. Those old papers yeah, where yeah, yeah. yeah, we actually I think we have like a cutout of that that we keep in the office. <laughs> Yeah, it's like Web 1, uh, when I was a teenager, like people say, yeah, w- the internet's fad, it's going to disappear, like fax machines are more useful and stuff. And like Web 2, everyone was like, why Why does everyone want to know what I'm eating for breakfast and stuff like that, you know, regarding like Twitter, which obviously has become right, kind of important with uh, hindsight and social media is like enormous. People, people don't see these things ahead of the time, right? And there's people like us who recognize these new trends and start getting interested. And like, I'm not, I'm not going to say that, I'm good at recognizing trends, but I do keep finding myself interested in things that then sort of take off. So, you know, I think this is just, we're in that period. You're right a bellwether. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, everyone thought the last bull cycle would be it, but it'll be this one. <laughs> well, you know, I, since you, you said that, like, you draw this parallel between essentially like the internet and like what programming was when you were going into your career and web three now. Um, I think we can also talk about like the parallel because like you deal specifically with open source software and that's, that's our topic for this episode. Um, and there's a huge parallel, like, I guess between that and blockchain, like I think the two of them are at a huge intersection because so much of like blockchain is basically powered by and, and being created by open so- source software, OSS devs. I think there's a huge intersection between open source software software and blockchain and it's just because most blockchains or at least the most popular ones that we use today are essentially open source and so i wanted to kind of discuss that intersection and um, talk about where exactly it is because there's like so many different like my personal opinion is that it's an overlap like a major overlap of ideologies um so what do you think uh is at the crux of the intersection between these two industries yeah um, so, you know, I'm, I'm relatively new to all this stuff, I have to say, like, I feel like a newbie uh, half the time because I only really got into it about two and a bit years ago. Uh, but what I've really noticed in my journey here is that blockchain is open source. Uh, it, it isn't just an intersection, it is a natural evolution of where open source has been and where it's going. All the same people are working in it behind the scenes. Now, open source really is like the part of the iceberg you can't see, right? It's uh, And it's under there, and people don't know that uh, there's all these people just working on it and, like, beavering away, just trying to make cool technologies and trying to make, like, better technologies. And the open source ideologies, if you look back, they were all the same stuff about privacy, security, decentralization. That was, like, the key, the crux of it. And then even like, people like myself. Like this whole collaboration over isolation and and like individual like ownership this like so many things are the same like i find that you said decentralization we got the collaboralization collaboralization yes <laughs> collaboration got collaboration what happened it be a word. um yeah the, yes but also like <laughs> transparency accountability the forking that's like innate in open source uh, software that's like just Something that yeah. it's so native well, to own, blockchain. Ownership and, was, yeah, own, ownership is a big deal as well. Um, well, it's just like the, the properties of ownership and understanding it, attributing it, and understanding what yeah. is free and what does free mean. Like these things, like they go all the way back to the dawn of like modern, well, like 
uh, open source as, as such. Like I put, I consider the uh, the dawn of open source to be like when Unix was created, right back in uh, Bell Labs, mm -hmm. and because uh, their hacker ethos was what uh, crafted like what the open source ideologies became. And blockchain is just like an obvious like it's clear that whoever Satoshi was, he was deeply embedded in like the open source community of the time. Yeah, he understood that thinking that like set of ideologies like there's, there's no coincidence i think that some libertarian ideals really do like correspond well with open source um so yeah like it, it, there isn't an intersection as much as like we forgot what open source was i think for a bit but i did like because i was deeply embedded in it when i created homebrew and then the iphone turned up right that's when programming became <laughs> cool when the iphone turned up I remember like the sun transition between like nobody wanting to know anything about my career to everybody telling me their app idea. And uh <laughs> Oh wow. Uh and then suddenly like everyone wanted to get in it. Do you think that that's what like the rise of blockchain technology like when I I started in blockchain like around 2019 so and I know that there was this big boom in 2018 and then it was relatively quiet. And then there was another big boom in 2020, early 2021. Um, and I, I distinctly remember how suddenly like it was all over the media and everything. Do you think blockchain's boom sort of uh, made us remember about open source? Um, do you think that that like helped spur its popularity again? Like not that it was not being used, but rather that it wasn't being publicized as much. Hmm. And then suddenly it was, it was hot again. It was sexy. Yeah, well, you know, I kind of feel that the the popularity that crypto has is really not the open source part at all <laughs> right and um it, the problem that crypto and blockchain and web3 have is this like association with that aspect of it and when we're going to win will be when we find like some real like genuine utility use cases that start spreading out from like probably the hackers right like that's that's who built web 2 that's who built web 1 that's who built the software industry before that and uh that's who built linux and all the other like massive open source projects so yeah like that's you know i'm, I'm bullish from what i do obviously at t but uh you know i feel that we have something which could be uh, like transformative for the sector like you know essentially what we're trying to do is um what i've been trying to do since i got into this industry which is fund myself um sorry you got cut back some words say fund <laughs> so, support myself in my pursuit of uh doing open source full time uh that's that's how i got into the industry right i did a chemistry degree I went into the chemistry industry for a year. I discovered that actually everybody was right and chemistry is extremely boring. And it mm. depressed me. I disagree. I really <laughs> like chemistry. I like it better now I don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> the problem was <laughs> doing it 40 hours a week. Um, yeah, well, I could go into that more, like, but I won't, unless you ask. Um, so I, I quit and then I installed Linux on my computer at home and I got into the open source communities that I discovered uh, on in Linux and my, it was uh, enlivening for me. It um, was addicting and I wanted to do it. And so I, I started working on this app and that got me recognized by this startup in London and they gave me a job. So I got into the industry just by open source. Don't have a computer science degree. It's a famous tweet. Where I didn't get a job at Google, like the, it's all about that. And um, so, you know, what I always really wanted to do was work on open source. And that's how Homebrew came to be, right? I, I built it because it's something I needed at the job I had at the time. And uh, then I quit that job in order to work on it full time. And like, so really, my career has been this cycle where I had like jobs that I kind of enjoyed, sometimes enjoyed a lot. And uh, then I quit to work on open source like homebrew alone like interesting question about your jobs and stuff because i was trying to read up earlier a bit on how people who work in open source are actually getting paid and compensated for their efforts and you know this applies both to people working in the blockchain space and without um just for our listeners who a lot of them are probably more blockchain based it, it applies to both so how um like 
how are you being compensated? Like at one point you had a job, so essentially you were able to, through open source and through what you were doing with open source, essentially get like salaried at a company. But uh, at times when you quit and decided to like work on your own thing, how were you funding yourself essentially? Well, I've never been paid to work on open source. Unfortunately, some mm -hmm. people manage it. And do you think, well, wait, do you think then crypto can change that? Yes, well, that is what we're hoping we can do at T for sure. Um, so, you know, like as the saying, I've always tried to figure out how to make it possible for me to work on open source full time. And I tried a few things and they just didn't work. So as well, exploring those ideas again, I came up with what is T essentially. And it was this realization that um, tools like package managers, they, we map out all the open source that there is. We understand how all the different open source projects are connected. And we understand which ones are more important than others because of these connections. And like every project's making its decisions about what projects it uses, its dependencies, the other packages in that graph. And it goes all the way up and all the way down. And I realized like while I was researching blockchain tech that, you know, there was this interesting possibility there. If you mapped out this data onto blockchain and then you wrote the right sort of smart contracts and you got people involved, you could create like a system which understands like the relative values of all the different projects. And, you know, using the best things about blockchain technologies, like automating huge chunks of that and uh, creating like, you know, DAOs per project so that they could organize how like the token flows in their different projects and things. And I was like, wow, this idea is kind of interesting. So uh, um, an old friend who worked in blockchain tech for eight years and tried to get me into it. And I told him, and so we managed to raise, we raised like 18 million and uh, yeah, so we've been building it for good job. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was a good raise. And um, was that a funding round? Yeah. Like a standard funding mm -hmm. round? Yeah. Okay. There was two rounds. Oh, okay, two rounds. Um, so we've been building for a little over a year and uh, gearing up for uh, an incentivized testnet launch uh, at the end of this year or early next year, basically. So, yeah, we're, we're hoping that it can change the, the bits of open source that need changing without changing the bits that don't need changing. Like, everyone's always scared about the idea of... Mm -hmm changing how these things were but like the truth is over the last 10 years we already have been changing it like open source is different now because yeah as you were saying like you thought that these companies were paying me to work on open source because that that happens now you know like google do have a bunch of uh people on their staff that work on open source projects and facebook and microsoft uh, but it's not how open source is meant to be built is the truth like these companies even if they're well intentioned they still have an agenda or two that eats its way into how these things are run that's something that's really cool about uh say like bitcoin and ethereum developers uh like i think most of it is just uh, it's that volunteers are essentially maintaining these blockchains through you know open source and everything and i think that that sets up a completely different impetus to why they're doing it because it can't only and solely be financial if you know, there's no set money they get. Like they get grants. Like I remember at Nexo, I think it was like in, a couple of years ago, we actually donated like, um, I think like $150,000 to the Brink uh, who then give the grant to, uh, I think it was Bitcoin developers. So they do get like grants and stuff, but um, I think there's just like a different impetus, which implies uh, some kind of like a higher goal, I guess. I, I think it, I guess it, it speaks to, um, people's different ideology you know it's it's not just a job it's not just uh okay company x wants me to do this i'm just going to do it because they're just going to pay me it's just like no i want and this community wants and this really comes back to open source and like the strength of community and, and the importance of community that like is a part of the definition of both blockchain and open source that um that like their whole developers are, are essentially embodying by being volunteers. So I don't know, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Like maybe the, the community sense and the idea? Yeah, well, you know, I think um, like one of, one of the things I learned about all this is like the, the, the different incentives that go on with open source. I've had to think about that a lot. And uh, 
you know, a lot of the time, the, the incentives for open source developers initially are just like self-motivated in some manner. Like they love the tech, they love the, their interest in the tech, but real open source developers are just real, you know, geeky engineer types who just want to build something. And then they sort of end up getting stuck in it, right? And like, we all know how like it's kind of ridiculous how like mm. these uh, like high profile devs on Bitcoin, for example, like don't don't actually get any like sponsorship or anything like significant. And like, you know, like partly is because like no one built in an incentivization system for them, right? Like even Ethereum devs didn't really, apart from like- But the, I think uh, that's good. Well- because it, it keeps it kind of pure, you know, it, it's like it, there's an option for it. I think like with crypto um, and, and with blockchain specifically, I think what blockchain can actually really give to open source developers and that whole space is some kind of way to monetize their, uh, you know, their work, which is easier, be it through tokens or, you know, there's different business models you can use or like building D apps and then like working with that. There's any kind of dip, like business model that you can use with like crypto can really be helpful to, you know, get payment for your open source work. But I also think that like, I like that the pure blockchain kind of way it's set up, it doesn't set up like a financial incentive because then it works on the other incentives that open source devs have, which like you said, are a little bit more pure, you know, they're just really interested. So they just really want to build something and then they build it and like, oh shit, this works. I, we, we can use this. <laughs> yep. Well, you know, I uh, I completely agree in the respect that uh, it's been on my mind that the way T works has to make sure that it doesn't change like the nature of it. Like we don't want to turn open source into a capitalist system, and I think this is part of the reason why mm -hmm. some of the other attempts that have been made to uh, make it possible for people to work on open source full time just haven't worked out. You can't map existing models into open source because open source is its own model and it needs like a, a blockchain system built on top of it which understands that and understands how to uh you know incentivize it correctly and like yeah i wouldn't have wanted bitcoin to make it so that you know if you work on it it changes like bitcoin's beautiful in it's like simplicity and uh, we always need yeah. at least one of those um, but you know, you, you have to incentivize in some manner. Like I worked on homebrew for, you know, I, I did at least 10,000 hours on it. And uh, in the end, I just burned out. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it anymore. And like other members of the community stepped in and took over. Uh, they'd already stepped in. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's clearly stagnant, right? Um, it, you need to incentivize correct kinds of maintenance like this is this is the the stuff that is powering the entire internet and a lot of software nowadays it's like it's just almost impossible to find software that doesn't have some open source in it it's the truth nowadays i'm sure some enterprises try yep. very hard to make it 100 percent so they no, don't no I, I read about this behind. as well they were just like all sorts of like statistics that were all just kind of like all of the major companies, Google, Facebook, Apple, all of them have essentially at least a part somewhere down there. There's some open source in places and that's not few places. So there's actually a lot going on there. And a whole question of that, like behind that is that they're not properly uh, tracking and essentially compensating open source developers, even their own developers that are developing in like the OSS space. And then there's this whole thing of like proprietary, um, proprietary software that's tainted by OSS and like I get a little bit triggered when I hear that because like tainted makes it sound like it's dirty and the problem is essentially the the patent or the the licensing of that like software yeah you use someone else's open source effort and now you can't essentially like seal it with your little seal um and and I think that that's that comes back to what you were saying about like capitalism, like open source, it, it doesn't bend to the rules of capitalism, or at least like that's not its that's not its ideology, that's not its ethos. And it comes back yeah, to like well, by by design. Yeah. And then there's like this whole thing of like how OSS devs could like fund their endeavors and like their their products and everything. And there was a few examples that I read about that were like, yeah, it can be ad supported, it can be data driven revenue. And I'm just kind of like, hang on, hang on. Like, why are we turning it into the web to capitalist capitalistic situation? Like, I think that OSS can can do more. And that's where I think blockchain can come in, because I think that that's 
you can create a different way to like fund yourself through crypto rather than, you know, ads and just like selling data, essentially just selling something. Um, I think it can be better. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I think what humanity didn't realize because it's been so long since we invented money and all that is that, you know, you can build different economic systems and software makes it possible to make them very complex, right? Because like the, the the systems we built were as simple as possible because no one would like tolerate anything else. It was like a natural evolutionary system that built these systems. Uh, people just would do what they want. And like, you know, over the last 200, 300 years, like smart people have turned up and made like more increasingly complex financial instruments, which of course has led to the current economic climate that seems very unstable, but that's a completely different conversation. So, you know, uh, with blockchain technologies, you can build new kinds of economies and uh, that work like in ways that seem foreign, don't seem right. So like with TU, our, our system is uh, one where we uh, build like these rankings. We use like a variation of Google PageRank, um, you know, because that was what we the idea was. And then we realized that Google had already done the papers. So we did the research and adapted it. And we have what we call T-Rank, which is the rankings for every open source project that exists. And we're calculating that on a daily day basis. And then the value light is distributed based on that. Uh, there's no like payments per install and things like that. There's a, you know, you, like people think, uh, so I'm going to use package manager and then I'm going to have to pay like a cent or something to install node every time I install it or whatever. Well, that would fundamentally change how open source works. So I knew from the start that we just couldn't do it that way. We had to figure out a different way to like assign that value and then inject that value and distribute that value. So, you know, it's just, it's a different way of doing it. And like, I think that's why it's got a really good chance of working. So very excited about the incentivized testnet where we're going to like appeal to these open source developers to register and then see like what sort of value they would be accumulating on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, you know, like we've got a lot of incentives built in to get them to sign up and then get other projects that they use to sign up going to be a fun time. Yeah, I think that that is really cool if if you look at it from the blockchain perspective of like how you would be able to see, you know, who is contributing how much, I guess, and and in what way so you can actually track value yeah. of a person cuz I I guess I I wanted to kind of ask about what you think um blockchain can give in terms of keeping open source open source but also giving credit like besides the monetary compensation i think credit is a big deal and it's it's part of the incentive especially as for uh you know a developer who is working and is very passionate um is there any way we can use blockchain technology to uh essentially give credit like be it an nft of like say ownership um that isn't tied necessarily to the right to use something because that's too that's a that's a different thing like you can you can buy an nft that's you know yeah you have number i don't know 52 out of 100 of you know this picture um but it doesn't mean that you have the right to use this picture or you know nobody else has the right to use it it just means that you have you know, this thing, this collector's item. So like, is there any way through NFT technology or any kind of blockchain way that um, OSS devs can actually have more credit to their work and have more like a traceable record of their work, which I think would help them in a career sense? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I really like those sort of things to be built on top of what we're building. Like the original pitch was that we would use NFTs as a releases open source releases thus making like an immutable record of open source releases which i still really want to do because like there's great security benefits to that right like you can uh be sure as someone that's consuming open source that the uh project dow signed this release and then what you've got is exactly what they said it would currently there's an awful lot of centralized trust that exists in open source graphs for like you know anyone and so I see like that being a, a benefit that enterprise doesn't see coming with what we're building. But you know, we, we've scaled it back, and what we're building initially is this graph of the un understanding of the connections between all the different projects, 
and their relative values. So I'm sure that there's going to be some very interesting DeFi things that people can build on top of that, including like some NFT stuff that I'm sure like is going to be very interesting. Uh, you know, whether or not like you can give more ownership to the open source developers themselves, like I don't personally have any ideas on that front, but like it's one of the best things about working in open source and why it's so great that Web3 is just it embodies the open source ethos that got me into this industry in the first place is that you build cool technologies other people will see things that you never thought of, you know and like that just doesn't yeah happen. exactly take it to the next level mm -hmm. and uh you know it's, it's the way i've always built because that's just what makes it so exciting it's like okay i thought of a cool thing i don't have to think of all the cool things and that's the problem with like normal companies right it's like you could go bankrupt because you didn't think of enough cool things and uh i hate that about normal business <laughs> It's kind of like this this thing of like not allowing the hive mind, the collective hive mind to come up with something genius just because somebody has to have the credit and somebody has to have the ownership. And I just think that blockchain and the open source space both are just kind of like, screw that. Let's use the hive mind because we can get further. And I think that's why we're kind of in this like weird situation right now where I guess traditional finance is, uh, you know, kind of baffled by how far this space has come because they never thought it would make it this far, but it has. <laughs> and and it's, it's because we're, we're using everybody rather than, you know, isolating a certain amount of players who are going to get the credit and the exactly. financial win off this and everything. It's a, it's a very good point. I haven't really thought about it, but like, you know, that lack of ego in the space is part of the reason that it does so well. Like half the people that I interacted with uh, on the internet for open source in, in the whole time I've been doing it. I never knew where they lived, what they looked like, anything about them. Just like this image they picked of themselves and like an alias that could, you know, could be their name, might not be. Yeah. And like, it just didn't matter. Yeah. You know, like they earned the respect by their work and that was all they cared about. Uh, they didn't, you know, the other things were, um, separate but you know the truth is like you gotta pay rent you gotta find a way to eat and um i think the people building this indispensable and incredibly important technology that powers so much and like will continue to power so much in the future uh they should have a way to do that full time like, i always say that you know i i create homebrew and like that was a part-time thing for a lot of my career like what would i have created if i'd been able to work on open source full-time i created a few other things uh like one of these things i made was uh, a library for iphone because i got big into iphone so i say i sort of lost my way and uh it was used by 100,000 <laughs> apps 100,000 apps at its peak including netflix and mcdonald's and burger king and i didn't get anything never like even a, a single dollar of sponsorship not like a netflix subscription or a free big mac or anything and, uh, you know, it's part of the reason that I sort of came, got to this point is like one, one year, I realized that if every single one of those people using this library I'd written gave me a dollar a year, um, then that would be enough for me to work on it. That would be enough. Uh, it's not the best salary in the world for a software developer, but it, you know, it was sufficient. I, it's what I wanted to do. I would have done it. And then I could have made other projects, you know? So like the, that's the, the essence of this is, is the understanding that there is a lot of open source, but there's an awful lot more consumers of that open source. And they don't actually have to um, put that much into the system for it to work. The, the numbers work out. You just have to create a system that works. And like, so part of the problem is like, you know, you go Microsoft, for example, like they probably use 10 million open source projects. How on earth are they going to uh, put value into that? Like, how are they going to find each of those projects? How are they going to, like, find out how to, like, uh, communicate with them and, like, sort out this sort of exchange? Um, it's impossible. So I sympathize with their situation. Like, how, you know, what can they do? Like, in the end, all they decided they could do was hire some of these people, right? So that's what they did. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's smart, but I also think that like if you were to use kind of like a blockchain system of some sort, traceability would be easier because every transaction would be visible and you can actually yeah. backtrack as much as you want and nobody could ever hide that from you. Like <laughs> even if you were some kind of like, you know, some guy, uh, you know, in, in some smaller country who don't want to be found, don't want to be compensated, um, you know, they could find you and be like, uh, hello, we would like to, um, you know, give you 
what what your work is worth because you know we see that you contributed to this ultimately which i think is pretty cool um and you know it's like currently this functionality in blockchain like we talk about it a lot in terms of kyc for like uh you know basically tracking money flows which is really important and like aml um yeah it's more it's more anti-money laundering but i think it could also be used for you, you know for for the positive side of this for finding the people who need to be financially compensated or even just congratulated for something because it, it could just be such a good thing, um, such a positive way to use the traceability. And it doesn't ruin the pseudonymous nature of blockchain. Like they still don't need to know who this person is uh, with zero knowledge. We could even like actually send them physical comp, like get them their compensation without in the end finding out who they are, where they are, whatever, which is just so good, you know? Mm. Yeah, well, indeed. Like there's... Like these are real tangible, like good things about the technology, and uh, I think it's very typical that people only focus on the the negative things about the technology, right? Like they're all like, "Oh, well, terrorists use it and stuff like that." Like <laughs> terrorists will find a way to transfer value around, right? Like, you know, they, <laughs> they will. Like, yeah, it's like this thing of like they've been using traditional finance and cash itself for, you know, centuries for terrorist financing. And, you know, crypto is just the newest thing that, you know, they've just scratched the surface of. But anyway, that's a different topic. Um, <laughs> I want to go back to the collaboration element of OSS. And I know that like when a lot of people are collaborating on be it code, be it anything, uh, there is essentially a decision making um process of where something is going. And I was wondering how that, I, I don't know, since I'm definitely not a developer, understand nothing about programming. Um, how does that process work in open source projects, especially bigger ones? Uh, because I was wondering from there then, uh, can blockchain governance in any way change that? Because, you know, in the blockchain space, the way it works is like, okay, you know, we we're creating this blockchain, it's open source and everything, uh, you know, we're maintaining it. And then when we want to make a change, uh, we use our governance function or we fork. So how does, like, is that how it worked in the open source space before that? And do you think that like the having blockchain governance around now is going to change the way decision making is made in open source? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, my understanding of the history of open source governance is that um, when I got involved in it, I noticed that code is king. I'd see like these uh, arguments on mailing lists because that was where most of the conversation happened at that point. There was ILC and mailing lists and ILC is like a really old chat technology, which I actually kind of miss because no one uses it anymore. Everyone switched to Slack, but anyway. Um, and like people would argue for weeks about little minutiae of details. And then someone would just say, I, I just committed what I thought. I, I put the code in. And then everyone would be like, oh, okay. And just leave it. Because <laughs> uh, code was king. Uh, the, the truth was, like, if someone could be bothered to do it, then that's how it stuck. And like, honestly, that system did not work well. Because you just had no one like making some of these decisions. Well, 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 with some projects, it worked really badly with projects with user interfaces because developers typically aren't very good at those. So that's why Linux, like, not widely regarded for its use. Yeah. <laughs> but like, then you had people like Linus Torvalds leading Linux, and he led it with an iron fist. So I learned early on that the best way to do open source was like with a benevolent dictator who then eventually stepped down and handed it to the community when the project was mature. Now. I don't think that's the best way either. And I, over time, we've learned like these other ways to do it. So nowadays, like big projects typically have uh, committees, governance committees with well-defined rules for how it works. And it mostly works. Like every now and again, there's like uh, some arguments about things or like some po political like things happen. Yeah, political lobbying. <laughs> Yeah, uh, like Rust had something recently, which, you know, I think they're embarrassed by. And um, so I think, you know, yeah, like there's a lot that can be done with blockchain, taking away some of the personality, uh, making the, the voting system like transparent and clear and like allowing people to have the sort of amount of voting rights so that it makes sense. And then, you know, we're programmers, we love to write things. So people are going to tweak 
these things. And so, you know, I'm hoping that he will encourage every open source project to have a DAO. Like if they use no other feature, like I can't see how they wouldn't use the main feature. But, um, you know, the, the main thing is that we will present a bunch of DAO templates and then these projects will take those and they will be able to like adapt them to how their project works. Well, it's very important because like, while well, every open source project has a different niche, it also has a different like community and uh, uh, a different like group of people who both build it, use it, consume it, and like the different needs for who to get involved with it, right? Like historically, like roles yeah. like translation have fallen by the wayside because they just weren't like glamorous enough, but like, you know, you need that. So with the right uh, DAO template, you could like incentivize that correctly. So yeah, I think like it's a very natural fit and like open source projects are gonna like love this. You know, they just need the right system to be built for them to build on top of it. Um, you know, like, and you don't think that that's like that already exists somewhere along the already blockchain based projects? You know, it's just all about like that easy onboarding is the truth. Of ah, it. yes. <laughs> with like, just so many things, and blockchain just feels difficult. So there isn't like an established way for open source projects to like just like build this kind of thing. Um, so it seems we were creating the graph of open source. And it would just be there. So you're an open source maintainer. You turn up and you go, oh, well, this is my project. Search. Ah, there it is. It's already here. Click a button. Oof. I have a DAO. Damn. Done. Like, it's just too simple. And, like, you need those kinds of things. And, like, you need a certain, like, mm -hmm. um, you, see, you need a certain amount of initial mass, initial velocity behind these things as well. Like, it's, it's, yeah, it's the adoption. Even the sad truth of open source. Yeah. Yeah, and, and blockchain, I think, still has quite a high learning curve. So I can totally understand why adoption is still yeah. stifled, even on at a level of people who are developers. And it would be easier for them to jump from, you know, just, you know, being an open source developer to perhaps being an open source blockchain developer or just even understanding blockchain well enough to kind of like work with the the DAO situation and the governance. Yeah, but exactly. yeah, blockchain, steep learning curve. Um, and I think that that's really uh, where the industry is starting to mature is that we're starting to understand the need for education and for proper UX. Like you mentioned it, like uh, I was working with a lot of our UX designers um, on actually talking about how we design the app so that people don't need to feel that complexity of blockchain, but can also get the sense and the benefits of using it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's tough because if you go over it too much and you mask it too much, it doesn't like people don't understand the benefit. And they're just like, well, why don't I just use my bank? And we're just like, well, because <laughs> listen, <laughs> this is fundamentally different and what you're working on. Um, so is there any challenges that you've uh, noticed uh, from the open source perspective uh, working in the decentralized space specifically, so the blockchain space? Well, you know, doing decentralization properly is hard. And uh, I would always recommend starting off with as much centralization as like your audience will um, suffer, will tolerate, and then decentralizing over time because, you know, it can be so difficult uh, to do initially that you might just end up taking too long or making it too complex. And you never really truly understand which bits are important to decentralize initially anyway. But, you know, it's um, it's key to, uh, you know, like you don't need all the parts to be decentralized for most blockchain projects is the truth. It's just, that should be the goal over time. Um, so, you know, it's, it's difficult, but um, I think the hardest part of blockchain is like just designing the system correctly, understanding like the aspects of game theory that you have to make sure that you're incentivizing the right people and not the wrong people. Uh, that's the hardest part. Like, it's the most interesting part about blockchain technology for me is that you have to uh, design so much upfront. I'm used to uh, being given like more chances to get it right <laughs> mm, <laughs> rather than just yeah. one. Uh, <laughs> like, usually that's how it works with technology. Yeah, I, I think with like blockchain, we have like a bit of a cultural issue in this space with urgency and the like just the immediacy of everything. And we want everything to happen now. So yeah, I can totally understand how like you're used to having a little bit more time, whereas you enter the blockchain space and like you do one thing and everything goes haywire and people are people are very, very active in this space. There's a reason that X is uh, essentially so important for the space because it's it's so live. 
Uh, it's so instant and constant 24 uh, seven. So that's a cultural thing, I think. Um, and it's not my oh, personal it's, favorite it's thing about crypto. Yeah. yeah. It is, it is, but it's also exhausting and it leads a lot of people to to kind of burn out. Yeah. Um, but I think the blockchain will mature, like we will get past this um, essentially. And it, it, it's going to come actually with more people who are coming in. There's like, look, no, listen, innovation comes with having like more than one try. And we saw this now with the the newest Ethereum um, upgrade. I think it was, I think it's called Whole Sky. Um, and it, it went wrong, like something went wrong there on Testnet. And it's actually no big deal you know it's it's great it's it's a great learning that you know ethereum who executed uh you know Shang the shanghai upgrade capella the merge last september like they did all these things and you know they're running great right now on mainnet but you know they had this like blip the last couple of days on a testnet and that's okay so you know we are working towards a more patient okay, system cool. and what's cool is like from a yeah from a pr perspective i i can totally see that um it's it's not turning into like a big splash in the space everyone is just like yeah, okay. You know, we have information. Didn't work out. It's testnet. It's fine. No damage done. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of like proud of blockchain <laughs> these days. Yeah. Well, you know, like also it's, it's freaking remarkable, freaking remarkable what they did managing to transition Ethereum from um, to proof of stake, oh, like yeah. and they just worked. Like that's incredible planning, understanding of the technology. Like sleepless nights, no doubt. Like they don't get enough credit. That never I, happens. Like you can't even update Zoom without there being a new bug in it. You know, like it never happens in the software. Industry. Every time, yeah. <laughs> like most, mostly, most software is not the robustness and reliability are afterthoughts. So yeah, good on them. They did an amazing job. I know. I know. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're kind of wrapping up towards the end of the ex the episode and i wanted to ask you about what your future vision is from the open source perspective for what blockchain and open source can achieve in terms of social impact and like significant change for the future like where do you think the biggest value is going to be hmm. the marriage of these two um i guess industries although they're they're kind of sister industries yeah, well, the way I see it working out is, you know, Web3 has taken a while, like, uh, you know, Bitcoin was released, what, 2009, and, you know, uh, the iPhone was released uh, 2008, um, and, like, obviously, the iPhone has had a much bigger impact at this point. It's difficult to um, change something as fundamental as what blockchain does, but we're starting to see people building the right kinds of utility on top of it. And that that's where it's going to start like feeding its way into other things. So, you know, I don't think it will be considered separate, right? Just, just like when Web2 was getting going, um, people didn't understand how that was going to become everything on the internet. Like nothing is, you know, how it was before that point uh, after adding social features and... <laughs> You know the, the the kind of not really good um, dopamine like oh yeah <laughs> system where people are just like continuously like and clickbait like yeah and the, the thirty same. second TikToks where we can't focus <laughs> anymore and <laughs> yeah you know, that's where the dopamine right, like machine things, is right? yeah. but like everyone's just accepted it and like no one calls it Web two anymore it is just the internet so that's the future that we got is that we're not going to be talking about it as though it's like separate. It's going to be part of everything. And then we'll this will be on this podcast in uh, five, ten years, and we'll be talking about what Web <laughs> went for is, right? And uh, we'll look back and go, oh, yeah, you know, there was a point where we didn't realize it was going to work out like that. And so we're definitely there. And, like, open source is blockchain, like blockchain. They're just the same people working on it. It's the same ethos. Uh, so open source will just be moving on to the next thing that's changing the world. And uh, hopefully, though, in the future, it'll be uh, more people working on it. That's the plan, right? It's what I want T to bring to the world is that. So that some of these engineers who work at Facebook and Microsoft right now could like quit and using T protocol work on open source full time. Nice. Well, uh, thanks very much, Max, for all your insights today. It was lovely to have you. Um, and for all our listeners, remember to like, subscribe to the episode and recommend it to all your friends. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you very much.